G'day everyone, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Backing it up, uh, I was in a bit of a mood to continue this little series of redrafting previous drafts. Now, uh, yesterday on the channel you would have seen I had a crack at the 2022 draft, and for the most part I was pretty happy with how I went. Maybe one or two things I would change uh, based on your feedback and cause me to sort of contemplate that, but I thought I'd have another crack at doing the 2021 version. Now this is quite different again, because we've actually seen a fair bit of these guys, and uh, certain players have really risen to the top and there are still players who uh, haven't really had the opportunity or are still long-term uh, players that are developing still or they've been injured so this one I actually found way more difficult and um, so I've had a crack at redoing the top 20 of the 2021 draft if you haven't seen the 2022 version uh, it's the last couple of videos on this channel so uh, go check out both if you like the 2021 draft was an interesting one. We had Nick Dacos in this particular draft. This was Horn Francis right before he spent one year at North Melbourne. And there's a few guns that uh, have really made their way up the rankings and, and a few players that I'm really not sure about, but we're going to have a crack. So let's do it right now. Although before I do it, if you could do me a favor and subscribe to the channel, if you're enjoying the content, that would be great. I'm trying to get to 24K by the end of November. Draft day would be ideal, uh, but without your help, I can't get there. So any help would be much appreciated. One other thing before I start, uh, yeah, I want to address the two elephants in the room. Uh, first of all, there is uh, sticky tape all over this microphone. I dropped it, and uh, currently, given that YouTube is my only job right now, um, obviously, it's not really paying the bills. I can't really afford to improve this microphone, so sorry about that. I'm just going to hold it further from my face. I'm self-conscious about it now. And the other one is the weird yellow lighting. I'm going to try and fix it in the edit, but um, yeah, we lost the light. All right, let's stop faffing around. Let's get into the 2021 draft. Now, pick one. This was originally held by North Melbourne, of course, and they took Jason Horn Francis. In this scenario, I am going to do the sensible thing and bid on Nick Dacos as a father-son to Collingwood. I think he is the clear number one player from this draft. I don't feel like I really need to sell you on this. He nearly won the bloody Brownlow this year. Probably would have won it too if he hadn't had those injuries, So, or that injury rather. So Collingwood matched the bid. And Nick Dacos joins Collingwood, surprise, surprise, which puts uh, North Melbourne back on the clock now. And uh, I'm going to double down on Jason Horn Francis. Now, in this scenario, we're not trying to just simply rank players on what they've achieved so far. We're still we're trying to do it in the framework of what would clubs do in this scenario if the draft was held right now based on what we know about these players. But I will ignore the fact that Jason Horn Francis obviously bailed on North Melbourne after a year. So there's a clean slate in that respect. And on talent, I think Jason Horn Francis, with his game-breaking ability, uh, still goes at least number two in this draft. He's had a pretty good season at Port Adelaide this year. Average about 17 disposals, still a young developing player, and I think has not even scratched the surface of his potential. So he would still go pick two. Pick three is the first time I'm going to shake things up in this particular video. Uh, we have GWS on the clock. Now, what actually happened in this scenario is they bid on Sam Darcy, which was mat matched by the Western Bulldogs, and then they took Finn Callahan. In this scenario, I'm not going to bother with that. GWS are on the market for a key forward, and they're going to take Fremantle's Jai Amos, who has had an unbelievable year this year and announced himself as one of the best key forward prospects in the competition right now. He originally went pick eight to Fremantle, but uh, his form this season really belied uh, where he should be at in his development stage. He kicked 41 goals from 22 games in a side that didn't really perform well, um, and it was the best season by a Fremantle key forward since Matthew Pavlich. So Jai Amos, I rate really highly. He would go to GWS at this pick. Then we have the Gold Coast Suns. Uh, I'm going to get them bit to bit on Sam Darcy, get him out of the way. Sam Darcy, it's still, we haven't seen a lot of him at AFL level. In fact, he's played seven games, but he has grown to 205 centimeters now. And the raw potential that we see, both as a key forward and as a key defender, and potentially a ruckman at that height as well, is enough to make me think he would still get picked pretty high in the draft. So I'll say the Western Bulldogs match at pick four in this scenario. Then the Gold Coast Suns are officially on the clock with their own pick, and uh, I'm going to get them... Josh Rochelle. So they took Mac Andrew in um, in the real draft. I think what we've seen from Josh Rochelle, you know, he was arguably a, a strong chance to win the Rising Star last year. Of course, Nick Dacos won it. He went pick six to Adelaide. I've got him improving by one pick. We've seen him uh, play 34 games at AFL level, kick 40 goals, and uh, the stats don't really indicate it with Rochelle. I think there's real match winning potential there as a forward midfielder. So I'm pretty happy with Rochelle going again as a top five pick, which then gives us the Adelaide Crows, and I will give them Finn Callahan in this particular scenario. So the real pick was Josh Rochelle. He's off the board. Finn Callahan went at pick three to GWS in this scenario, but I think what Rochelle's shown and all those other guys I mentioned, they would still go a little bit higher. But Callahan has a lot of potential as a as a genuine midfielder of the competition. You know, in the future, he's, he's played 21 games this year, had 21 disposals. You know, I think he had the most score involvements of any player that was eligible for the Rising Star this year, played in the prelim side, 
I think he's developed them really nicely, and he's still got real weapons to his game with his running carry and his um, his long left boot as well. So I think Callahan still goes pretty high in this draft. Not quite as high as he actually went, but still pretty high. The next pick is a bit of a roughie, but I've got Hawthorne on the clock who took Josh Ward in this real scenario. They're going to bid on St. Kilda's Machido Owens. I'm a big fan of Machido Owens, and uh, he was an outside chance for the Rising Star as well, um, capping off a great second season at AFL level. He's played 30 games now. He played 23 of them this year, and he kicked 26 goals and really stood up as a kind of like a third forward target there as well. He's a really quality player and um, an opportunistic one at that and at a really good height to potentially sort of push up into the midfield as well. So Machido Owens bolts from about pick 33 was where he was originally bid on by Sydney in the draft. I've got him going in the top eight or so picks. I've lost track of what number I'm at. Then Hawthorne are on the board here and they took Josh Ward originally. And in this scenario, I've got them taking... Jacob Van Royen. I always want to call him Jakob Van Royen. There's no reason. It's just because it's a Dutch name. But anyway, Van Royen debuted this year. I think he kicked three on debut and he went on to have a 20 game season where he kicked 28 goals and had bags of three, three and four. And I think Looms is a really strong key forward prospect of the competition right now. And I don't think, you know, if we, if we factor in needs to this, which it gets a little bit harder when you go into further drafts, but if we did, Hawthorne do kind of need a key forward too. And I think this is about where he would go if it was redrafted. Then we have Fremantle uh, taking their first selection. In this draft, they had picks eight and 10. I think I've got an extra couple of bids in there. So oh, this is now pick nine. They originally took Jai Amos with this pick. He is obviously gone in this particular scenario. So I've got them taking Naziah Wanganin Miller, who has quickly become a pretty good established player at St. Kilda already. He originally went two picks later to St. Kilda, uh, but he's played 41 games now. He played all of St. Kilda's 24 games this year. He averaged about 23 and a half disposals a game. He had multiple games of over 30 possessions and his running carry and his foot skills in particular are a real offensive weapon for the Saints. He had such a good year that he was actually ranked fourth in the league for overall kicks this year. So he finds plenty of it and he uses the ball well. I think this is um, about right. At pick 10, I've got the Richmond Football Club, and uh, they took Josh Gibkiss at this particular pick. I've got them taking Mac Andrew in this scenario. Mac Andrew is a hard one to read. Reason being, he was drafted as a raw, skinny ruckman, and he played 17 games this year as a tall defender. He did win a late season Rising Star nomination, and uh, the fact that he's still 201 centimeters, and if I'm not mistaken, he is 74 kilos, shows that he's still got a lot of development left in him. He could still end up a ruckman. He's probably just a bit light for it at the moment. But the raw potential's there, you know, he is doing it at AFL level and therefore if Richmond are on the market for a key back, this is probably the way they'd go rather than Josh Kipkis in this scenario. Then Fremantle are on the board again and they took Neil Erasmus with this original pick and I've got them taking Josh Ward. They're a little bit lucky that he's still available. He's coming in and been a solid role player for the Hawks in what is a fairly strong midfield over the last couple of seasons. He's played 30 games now and 16 of them this year. And he went at a very respectable average of about 21 a game, I think it was, and his disposal efficiency was around the 77 mark, which is pretty damn good for a midfielder. So there's kind of an evenness to a lot of the sort of midfield prospects that I'm about to go through in this particular video, but I had Ward, uh, upon closer examination, probably the best available of that. So he just slides a couple of picks. Then we have West Coast on the board at pick 12. Now, what happened originally at this pick was uh, Port Adelaide traded a pick 14 and a future second to move up to 12, where they took Josh Sin. In this scenario, I'm just going to keep it as the normal order. To be honest, it doesn't really matter. The, the actual teams associated with them is the least important part of this video. But let's assume West Coast still have this pick and I will give them Ben Hobbs from Victoria. He originally went at pick 13 to Essendon one pick later. So he more or less keeps his current ranking. But he's played 35 games at AFL level now, which is a pretty good effort for a young inside mid. He played 18 games this year for about 20 disposals a game about three and a half clearances a game too. So solid numbers for a developing inside mid. Again, to be honest, on talent, it's negligible between Ward and Hobbs. Uh, Ward has slightly better stats. They are slightly different midfielders. Hawthorne peaked Ward earlier than Hobbs actually went in the draft. So Ward over Hobbs. Now Essendon, having just missed out on the guy they actually took in Ben Hobbs by one selection, they're going to take Darcy Wilmot, who obviously went at pick 16 to the Brisbane Lions. Now Wilmot's had a pretty good career to date so far. I think he had a, about three games in his first season, but uh, played every game this year, all 26 games for the Brisbane Lions and played in their grand final. So as a running medium defender with weapons, I think that's a pretty good resume so far. And it, it does help that he's in a good system and maybe it makes him look a little bit better, but at the same time, he's earned that spot in a side that made it to the grand final. So 
would he go higher? Potentially, I'm discriminating against him a little bit because you'd probably still go the midfielders and the quality key position talents earlier. But Will Mott is still going to be, you know, he's improved on his original draft position. At pick 14, I've got Port Adelaide. Like I said, they originally traded up uh, this pick to get to 12 to take Josh Sin. But assuming they have the original pick of pick 14, I'm going to get them to take Jesse Motlop. Now, he actually went at pick 27 to Carlton. So he's another bolter in this particular video. But a very crafty small forward that played 21 games for Carlton this year was an important part of their forward line and kicked 24 goals, including a bag of four against Port Adelaide, which is the team I have him taking here. So on talents, on raw talents, and from what he's produced at AFL level so far, Motlop bolts up to 14. Okay, the next three picks I agonized over, to be honest. Um, it could be down to ignorance, but let me know what you think. I have got GWS next on the board. They originally took Leek Aaliyah. Uh, I don't really, I haven't seen much of Leek Aaliyah. So I've got them taking another bolter in Hawthorne's Connor McDonald, who originally went at 26. He's played 41 games, which is a pretty damn good effort for a second round pick. He played 21 games this year, averaging about 17 touches and about half a goal a game, which is pretty solid going. You know, he's kind of like a, he's about 185 centimeters, like a high half forward, plays a little bit in the midfield as well. There was a couple of big performances where he won plenty of the ball against teams like uh, North and uh, Richmond from memory. It's line ball. I think Conor McDonald on talent would go way earlier than 26 if it was redrafted. Um, let me know if you think the next pick should have gone higher. And that next pick belongs to the Brisbane Lions and they take Adelaide's Jake Saligo who originally went pick 36 in this draft. And to be honest, I, like statistically, it was so hard to split Conor McDonald and Jake Saligo and they're fairly similar players by their profile anyway. He's played 37 games as another midfielder forward, 10 goals from 21 games this year. It looks like towards the back end of the year, he played a little bit more of a midfield role because his uh, disposals really went up in the last three rounds. But he's basically established himself as a best 22 player at, uh, at the Adelaide Crows, so let me know who should have gone high between Connor McDonald and Jake Saligo because I'm going to piss off 50% of you. Then we have Richmond at pick 17. I've got them bidding on the other Next Generation Academy talent from St Kilda in Marcus Windhager, who started his career really well. I, I, at least this is just going off memory. I remember him doing some elite tagging jobs. One from Tim Kelly comes to mind. But again, on output, averages similar to the previous two players. This is not meant to be based completely on, you know, stats. But naturally, I look at stats to try and back up, you know, the way I feel. But when Hager averaged about 16 touches a game this year, again, playing as a bit of a defensively minded mid, but he did prove that he can get off the leash and win plenty of his own ball because he did have at least one 30 touch game as well. So a really good balanced prospect that I think will go, you know, in the first round if it was redrafted again. And it shows that St. Kilda have drafted really well. Admittedly, two of them are academy players, but to get Owens, Windhager and Wanganeen Miller so far, that's pretty good going. So then Richmond are back on the board with their actual pick here after the bid gets matched by St. Kilda. And I've got them taking West Coast Brady Hoff. Brady Hoff went at pick 31 in this particular draft. And I actually remember when we drafted him. Was it Dylan that came up and announced the pick and he called him Brady Howe? And I was like, I literally have no idea who that is. But Brady Hoff uh, drafted as a forward midfielder out of um, the Harvey region from Peel Thunder. Came in and established himself as a really skinny running halfback flanker. And this year, despite having only played 30 games, he looks like a player that has played about 150 with his skills, his speed, his composure. And you do feel like there's a lot of upside there with Hoff. It could push up into the ground. So this one's a bit of a bolter, but I'm happy to back it in. Then I've got the Sydney Swans with pick 19. This was uh, originally Angus Sheldrick, who I had in and out of this top 20 a number of times, but decided to go with the uh, player in Josh Gibkiss, who originally went pick nine to uh, the Richmond Football Club, of course. Now, Gibkiss, I've agonized over this one because he played 18 games in his first season and looked pretty good, like statistically performed to a pretty high level, but naturally 2023, he had his whole season ruined by injury. So again, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on this one and say that uh, he probably slides down the rankings because other players have you know, established themselves to some degree in the AFL. And of course, Sydney do need a key back and he's the next best available one. And finally, with pick 20, I've got Melbourne rounding out this video taking... Matthew Johnson, I almost forgot there. Now this pick was originally Jacob Van Royen, is long gone in this particular draft. This was tough because there's other players I wanted to include. So I'll, before I talk about Johnson, I'll list the other players. Angus Sheldrick, line ball selection, he went around the same range. Lika Lear, I just don't know that much about. He's only played like four games at AFL level and, and I haven't seen any of them. Neil Erasmus on potential could get there, but on performed output against Johnson and Sheldrick, for instance, uh, it didn't quite cut the mustard. There's Judd McVie as well. He played pretty well for Melbourne this year. And Paul Curtis is another player at North Melbourne who's caught my eye 
he tears up West Coast. But I decided to go with Matthew Johnson. I think he, the level and output that he showed this year showed that he would probably be the favor selection out of all these players, at least in my opinion. He debuted this season. He played 18 games. Seven of those, he was subbed on or off and averaged about 14 touches. So not a perfect representation of his season, but he did get a late season uh, Rising Star nomination and had some nice performances of over 20 touches and one even hitting 25. So again, splitting hairs between a lot of those even prospects. I just went for the guy that probably has shown the most at AFL level. If it was picked on raw potential, he'd probably go Neil Erasmus, but they're playing in the same team and Johnson is ahead of him in the pecking order right now. Anyway, guys, that is my crack at the top 20. I feel like this one could be a little bit more divisive. I've expected it to be easier than 2022 because we have more data, but no, it actually forced me to make some harder decisions. So as always, I welcome your um, constructive feedback in the comments below. What did I get right? What did I get wrong? Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.